you on, not see you, nice to, <laughs> nice to be sharing space with you <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, my name is Jen Loop. I am the Secretary and Events Chair of Traverse Area Historical mm -hmm. Society. And today we have a great program, three wonderful women. Um, March is Women's History Month. And so we'll be talking a little bit about women's, local women's organizations in the history of Traverse City in the region. Um, I'd like to give a little introduction to everyone. So we're gonna have Peg Siciliano. Peg's a trained archivist. She's on the board of the Traverse Area Historical Society. Um, all three of these women, um, along with Ann Magoon and Ann Sweeney, were co-founders of the Women's History Project of Northwest Michigan. Ann Magoon is a longtime member of the League of Women Voters. And along with Ann Sweeney, both Anns um, are founders of the Committee to Record the Stories of Traverse Area Libraries. And they'll talk a little bit about that as well. So Ann, Sweeney also was a librarian at NMC for 38 years and is now the archivist over there. So I will remind everyone, we're gonna keep you on mute during the presentation. Uh, you're certainly welcome to put any questions that you're gonna have, cause we're gonna get to questions at the end in the chat. And I'll also scroll through to see if anyone has any questions they wanna put, um, put to the presenters at the end. And so I am gonna hand over the floor to Ann Magoon. Good afternoon and thank you very much, Jen. And thanks to uh, the Traverse Area District Library and to Traverse Area Historical Society for giving us this opportunity to talk about some of our favorite things, uh, libraries in Traverse City and women's history. So we could talk all day about that, but I don't think that's what you signed up for and we wanna keep your interest. So we're just gonna give you an introduction to a couple of aspects of women's history in the area and libraries in the area and how they intersect and are important. So um, I'm Ann Magoon. My partner with this presentation is Ann Sweeney. She's doing the visuals. And we're just going to start with the Ladies Library Association. Um, I hope that what we're talking about today piques your interest and when it comes out that you will be interested in reading our book. Um, we hope it comes out this early summer, written by Heather Shoemaker, and it is a history of libraries in the Traverse area. So we have some great historians who have done work on um, these topics, Richard Fiddler, Jenny LeClaire, um, Amy Barrett, certainly Peg Siciliano has a wealth of knowledge about libraries and um, also the women's groups in, in this area. But today I'm going to introduce you to the Ladies Library Association, a group of women who back in 1869, when this area was uh, new in the sense of just developing into a city. Um, it was a township at that point. And then I'd like to talk about the involvement of the League of Women Voters uh, about a century later, 150 years later, when they got involved with libraries also. But the Ladies Library Association, you can gather from its title, was very, very focused on, on libraries. And why are they notable? To our knowledge and from anything we can find, they were the first group of female settlers to start a civic organization in town. And certainly the one that uh, was sustainable for up to 80 years. And so the Ladies Library Association was part of a larger movement of this kind of women's club in the late 1800s. But uh, Traverse City was actually quite early in, in developing its own Ladies Library Association. In Kalamazoo now, in 1844, it was still a, much of a, a pioneer town in, in the Michigan wilderness, but a book club started, which ended up uh, becoming a Ladies Library Association. That was the first one in Michigan. It was followed by one in Flint in 1851, and then the Traverse area 
um, Ladies Library Association was the third in the state. So that's pretty impressive when you think of this outpost and um, these women coming together and forming, uh, actually incorporated in 1871. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it was, a kind of using journalistic terms, who, what, when, where, why, and uh, we'll start with the what, more about the Library Association itself. It was a private organization. As I say, they incorporated in 1871, and membership was open only to women, but men were allowed to borrow, not right away, but after a little bit, the women decided that even men could be trusted with books apparently. <laughs> and so anybody could borrow. Um, but although it was a private organization, it was open to the community. And I think that's important to recognize that uh, the women controlled it. They decided the hours and the books and um, the policies, but it was uh, open to, to the people of Traverse City. Uh, there was also a township library and that was formed in the 1850s. We don't know too much about it. Uh, we know that there was funding uh, from the government and that they had some books and that they moved around depending on who the township clerk was for a while. The books were like they were on a few shelves and, and they bounced around a little bit. Sometimes they were on a back shelf in a drugstore. And so I guess the ladies library People were not so impressed with that and they wanted something different, something better. In addition to providing library services for the community, it was also uh, very importantly to them, a social and intellectually oriented club. Um, it was part of the women's club movement that was uh, big in, in all across the country at this time of our history. And I think Peg will talk a little bit more about other women's clubs. And it gave women a chance for a, a role, a defined role, respectable outside of their home and church. And they didn't have other, other opportunities to meet together in, in this type of, of group other than uh, some of these associations. So this was important to them as well. Now, at first, their library was just shelves like the township library. They had 79 books and they were kept in the U.S. land office. And if you recall in 1862, um, land was being uh, given away or sold by the government. It was right in the middle of the war, but they were trying to settle different parts of the country. And so land office business is a term we know about. Well, the land office in Traverse City was also the ladies library for a while. And I'll explain in a moment why it was there. And the land office was in the Leach building, which was an important building downtown. I'll, the name Leach is also important to the ladies library association. The editor, the publisher was uh, DC Leach and he a publisher of the Herald newspaper. And he had extra space in his building for the Travers Township office. When the circuit court was in session, um, it was held, the, the, the court sessions were held in the Leach building and that's where the ladies library kept their books in that land office. So I, um, it took a few years, some fundraising, building, building their small collection. And by 1878, they had their own building on Front Street. Um, they built a frame building. Uh, I think there's a photo of it there for you. And this was known as Library Hall or the Ladies Library Building. Library Hall was the upstairs and it was the largest hall. Uh, it could be rented out and it was frequently. It was the largest hall in the city until the City Opera House um, was built and in operation by 1892. So this was important to the city. All kinds of events were held here, including, um, well, I'll get to that in just a minute. I wanna tell you a little bit more about the building. So it's at the Northeast corner of Cass and Front Street. On Front Street, it's where Daisy Jane is today. I think the original numbers might have been different. I think that around Front Street, they, they have changed the numbers slightly, but it was right there next to what became a bank after they had moved in. 
Um, so on the ground floor, they took advantage of all this space. They rented out the front part. Um, often it was to two doctors, two separate doctor's offices in the front. And then the ladies library itself was farther back. And upstairs was this big hall. And, um, and all kinds of, of speakers and parties and things came to town, magicians, whatnot, and they would be in the ladies library hall. And uh, in 1879, just a year after the building was built, Susan B. Anthony came to Traverse City as part of her nationwide campaign for women's suffrage. And that was, that was a big event in town. Um, also the Hannah Rifles, a different type of event here. The Hannah Rifles was the military unit that had been formed uh, with Traverse City men. Um, and they did their drills here in bad weather. And that was until the ladies decided to put down carpeting and then they kicked the guys out. But that was just before the Spanish-American Spanish War started in 1898. But the fact that they had uh, drills up there tells you how, how large the hall was. Um, now, everything was going smoothly, as far as we know, for the Ladies Library Association. They, they were active, they grew. Actually, the township library, which by now was the city library because Traverse became a city in 1895, and um, in 1901, they said, hmm, we need more space. And they moved into the ladies library building, um, renting space again from the association. So it was, ma'am? Susan did B. You a, right, right, okay, thank you. Um, I started to mention Susan B. Anthony. Did I mention her in 1879 spoke? at the uh, library hall. And, um, and so uh, things are moving along. The Traverse City Library is getting larger. And there's a whole story of how they came into their own building, which you all might know was on 6th Street, um, built in 1905. And you thought, well, maybe that might be the end of the Ladies Library Association. But Nope. In 1909, four years after the uh, Carnegie Building was built for the Traverse City Library on 6th Street, the Ladies Library sold their building on Front Street and built a beautiful brick building on Cass Street. And that still stands today. And there's a historic marker out front. I'm sure you would recognize it if you drive down Cass Street. So they sold their building for $10,000, built a new building for $8,000. I'd say that's pretty pretty um, clever of them. And that was a lot of hoopla. The, the Cass Street building um, was built, uh, designed by the same architect who designed the, um, the Sixth Street Library building as well. You can see the classic architecture. Some of it, what you're seeing in the picture right now it has been modernized since uh, since 1909. The windows are are slightly different, but um, that's that's our beautiful ladies' library building. So let's go back to why would these ladies uh, put put together put put everything down on a July hot afternoon in 1869 and go indoors to the Leach Building? and say, well, let's, let's do this project that nobody had ever done up here before. Um, well, we're not exactly sure what all was on their minds, but there had been an article in the paper the week before about the Flint Ladies Library Association. And I think people read the newspapers um, front to back every week. And uh, Clemente Bates, the wife of Morgan Bates, uh, noticed this and convened a meeting. And by the end of the meeting, the group of women had decided to start their own ladies library association. They were very much aware of a bigger world. These women had not been born in Traverse City. Not too many people had been born in Traverse City. Uh, it was called Traverse City, even though it wasn't a city, it was Traverse Township. 
um, by 1869. And so these women were from away. They had come from East Coast, or from New York, from Pennsylvania, Ohio, downstate. Some of them were college educated and uh, they, were, they were interested in doing something for their community. Books were scarce and precious in those days in a way that we can't even imagine. To, to be able to have access to books was, was very important. Uh, they received mail just once a week, and I'm sure that they uh, were eager for more information about the world, sharing what they knew with each other, um, and also doing their part for, for civic improvement. Uh, two events that we know about that they were involved with, one was um, when there was a huge fire that destroyed the village of Lake Ann in about 1896. And immediately, along with many other groups, the ladies library put down what they were doing and started sewing um, supplies of clothing for the townspeople who had no homes and, and no, nothing to live with and um, gathering goods for them and made a huge donation to the, uh, to the people of, uh, for, to the response to the people of Lake Ann after the fire. And uh, I think the donation was $25. And that was one of the largest of any of the groups in the city that donated. Also, when those Hannah rifles, the, the guys that were the, the military unit that was getting ready to ship out for the Spanish-American War, the uh, Ladies Library Association members uh, put down what they were doing and made kits of supplies that the people that the, the soldiers could take with them. Uh, there's, there's a whole great story about how they made those kits and, and how much the soldiers appreciated them. So who were they? Well, back in 1869, the first group was a number of women of privilege, white women. As I say, most of them, uh, some of them were college educated and most of them were married. Clemente Bates was the ringleader and she was um, married to Morgan Bates, the Lieutenant Governor of the state. He also was the register of the land office and he had connections, certainly. Um, also her niece by marriage, Martha E. Cram Bates, that's Marcia, Martha Elizabeth Cram Bates, I believe. And uh, later on, she became an associate in her husband's newspaper business. He took over the Herald from, from Mr. Leach later on. She was a charter member of the Michigan Women's Press Association. So she was out and about in the community in a professional way. Mary Nisic, later Mary Buck, was a Bohemian immigrant. She was an author, poet, and later she was a library trustee for the city library. Minna Leach, uh, that Leach name you might recognize, it was her father who owned the building that they that they were in. So it was, um, as I say, women of privilege. They had mostly time on their hands. Some, some of their children were grown and some um, did not have children, but they were able to put their, their minds together and to come up with this, um, this process. Later, some of the members have names that you might recognize. Ada Sprague Pratt had her own millinery shop in Traverse City. And she was the sister of E.L. Sprague, um, a historian in his own right for Traverse City and a, another newspaper publisher. Marianne Roberts was a graduate of Oberlin. Estella Nealon was the wife of one of the doctors who rented space from the Ladies Library Association in, um, in, the, in the building on Front Street. You can see a picture of the group, this was not the original group. This was uh, 1892, I believe. And Estella Neeland was president for many, many years and oversaw many of the changes as the uh, organization grew. So, <clears throat> um, so these, these 
women also had connections with one another over the generations. Estella, as I say, was president of the Ladies Library Association for many years. Her daughter was also um, a librarian. She was, well, she was a librarian per se. With the city library, she was the librarian at the Oak Park branch. And her daughter is Julia, Julie Maxson, who was the director of the Peninsula Community Library. And as I mentioned, Clemeni and her niece by marriage, Martha Bates, were connected. And sometimes their sisters or, or daughters-in-law would be working at the city library as well. So they were connected. It was not uh, terribly competitive, it looks like. Granddaughter. Granddaughter, right, right. It went from Neyland to Hunter to Maxson, um, the three generations of librarians. In 1911, the Library Association had 175 members. So it tells you that it was, it was a force to be reckoned with in Traverse City. I've mentioned Morgan Bates and his involvement. Um, that was Clemeni's husband, Thomas Bates, another newspaper publisher, uh, Dr. Nealon in the, in the building, um, and DeWitt Leach, D.C. Leach. Um, let's see now. There are many other connections telling you just how well, well connected they were in town. These women had uh, good advice, we think, from the men they, they knew and uh, helped with fundraising. They got a $3,000 bequest from Smith Barnes, who had been the, um, the head of the mercantile uh, part of Hannah and Leigh. And he left them $3,000, which got them off to a great start with their uh, building. Um, and that was in the late 1900s and helped them be able to move to the, um, the new building as well. They had a very strong sense of history. Uh, they left reports of what they were doing. They, they celebrated their history and they um, prepared a time capsule, which is still in the 1909 building at Cass Street. Um, the organization held its last meeting in 1945. By then, we don't know what led exactly to their uh, decision to, to disband, but uh, as a great civic gesture, they gave the Cass Street building to the city uh, the city maintained it and, and ran it as it had been run by the Ladies Library for about 10 years. And then it became the city police station in the, uh, about 1958. Their cash, their other assets were given to the college, uh, Northwestern Michigan College, designated for, uh, to go to its library. So there's one thing before we leave the Ladies Library Association I want to mention, and that is that there is a building that often gets confused with Ladies Library Association. It's what was the Oak Park branch. This was at the corner of Washington and Rose. This is not the Ladies Library Association, it had nothing to do with the Ladies Library Association, but it gets confused because after it was a library, it was bought by the Traverse City Women's Club. And it belonged to the Women's Club for many years. Uh, the building is still there, fits nicely into the neighborhood and is now a private home. Okay, so uh, there are some parallels. We're gonna talk about the League of Women Voters and specifically the Library Committee. There are many parallels with the work of the Ladies Library um, Association and some differences. So briefly, the League of Women Voters is a national nonpartisan organization with roots in women's suffrage movement. It's now 101 years old uh, nationally and about 62 years old locally. Never supports or opposes any candidate or party for political office, but it does promote and encourage active participation of citizens in, in all aspects of government advocates on selected policy issues. And that's what takes us to our local library. The uh, league involvement with the libraries in Traverse City began way back in 
uh, about uh, early 1960s, when, when the league was brand new, its first study was about the local library. And so since its beginnings, it's kept an eye on that. And by 1965, it had completed the study. This was a group chaired by Mrs. Robert Dean, as she was known, Mrs. Robert Dean Jr. That was Arlene Dean and um, Jane Norton, Mrs. John Norton. And they reviewed the library services, found them pretty good, but there were some areas that they saw some improvement. And from then on, they kept an eye on what was going on with local libraries. Now, who were the league members? Pretty much uh, like Labor Ladies Library Association, they were privileged, many educated, most were married um, of the earlier group, but not necessarily with this uh, secondary um, group of women. Uh, also very interested in their communities and in community improvements. Interestingly, even in, in the 1960s and on, many league members were not native to the area. I'm just gonna throw out some of the names. There were many, many people involved, but especially in the group, the era I'll be talking about briefly were Betty Parker, a spark plug of the library committee. And uh, she had been a teacher at the high school, teacher of English. English. Judith Halstead uh, became the co-chair of the Citizens for Libraries group. Ellie Long was a trust builder, a tenacious advocate for libraries. And there were about 17 women at the maximum on the committee, but they called on others for help all the time. Um, so one difference between the early group and this group of women who were involved with libraries was that by the 1990s, and that's the area I'll be talking about, many league members were professional women or retired professional women. They had had their careers or were still involved with them and uh, women had a different role in the community. And they were, um, as I say, privileged enough to have time to be joining voluntary organizations, but their connections in town wasn't what guided them nearly as much as their careful analysis of a situation and their consensus on what needed to be done to, to make uh, a difference in their community. So what was the problem that these league members saw and what did they wanna do about it? Well, after the creation of the Traverse Area District Library in 1983, there were four member libraries that had been drawn into the district against their will in some cases, and they were kind of disgruntled. It wasn't a very cohesive district. The Sixth Street Library was overwhelmed with love of their patrons, but also overwhelmed and crowded with the books that they had and the materials that they had to offer. So here's um, Mike McGuire, longtime director of the first the city library and then the Traverse Area District Library. Uh, you can see that the shelves are packed and stacked and in the second picture even more so. <clears throat> By the early 1990s, after having twice been um, slapped down by the community, the Tattle trustees were pretty dejected and out of ideas about where to go. When I say twice slapped down, they had planned to go to the voters in 1989 to ask for funds for either um, expanding the, the Carnegie Library or building elsewhere or a combination of the two. And uh, there was so much opposition that they never even put it on the ballot. And then in 1991, they did go to the voters and the voters said, nope, we don't like this plan, stay where you are and deal with it. Staff morale, as you can imagine, was also low. So it's not a very happy situation when the League Library Committee goes into action. After they do study, if they and see a problem, have consensus on it, then often action follows. So league members were, were active um, in many ways, attended uh, trustee meetings, attended member library board meetings, worked to change negatives into positives, building trust, um, building community uh, support and uh, personal interactions, meetings, um, events, 
Uh, here's a picture of Ellie Long uh, conducting a survey of patrons at the Tattle Library. This was one of the, the many uh, things that League members undertook. By early 1995, the committee had developed a sense of what they wanted, which was a new library. And they, in April, held a meeting to introduce this idea of what a new library, what a good library could look like. And this was a well-attended meeting in, in the basement of Tattle and it brought together some important people. They knew they needed to broaden the scope of their work and to bring in others. As, as someone said, they needed a champion, somebody who could be out there and uh, get people's attention. So they expanded their efforts beyond the league itself and by June of uh, 1995 had the, the seeds of a new, new um, organization which became Citizens for Libraries. And here are the co-chairs of Citizens for Libraries. They are um, at a, an event that was to draw attention to and raise funds for a new library. It's Judith Halstead and uh, Dick Rosser. Uh, also, he was a newcomer to town, had just arrived and uh, he, he became co-chair, one of the champions. So the league uh, committee spent uh, just over a year the members working hard with the Citizens for Libraries to, to convince the community that we needed a new library, we needed better relations with the member libraries and that the Carnegie building needed to be repurposed and to be saved. So with its political arm, which was developed in the spring of 1996, the sister organization called Vote Yes for Libraries. Um, maybe you remember these stickers if you were around in those days, they were all over the city by then. Um, Citizens for Libraries worked hard with a League of Women Voters members, co-chairing every committee. And by August, early August of 1996, the tide had turned. And we knew that we needed at least, we thought that there could be as, as many as 6,000 uh, no votes. And so we knew we needed about 6,001 uh, yes votes for the millage and the bond issue. And we had more than 10,000 yes voters and um, just over 6,000 no voters. So it was a very successful campaign. And uh, that was August of 1996. Groundbreaking for the new building was in um, uh, May of 1997. And voila, here we have the Woodmere Library opening in January of 1999. So I, I propose to you that women and libraries in Traverse City go together, uh, that the women have made a big difference in, in many ways. And these are two examples of uh, civic cooperation, people coming together where they see a need and making something good happen, identifying a problem and identifying a solution. Uh, and I think our library is such a treasure. I, I wish we were all there today uh, in person enjoying it, but this is the next best thing. And again, thank you. Thanks, Anne. Um, I think Peg is up next, Peg Siciliano. We'll see if she, <laughs> she is around. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> I can hear you now. Okay, just give me a minute to get my screen share up. Oh, where is it? Okay. Why isn't this? Okay, I'm going to do that. You can still hear me, right? Mm -hmm. Are you seeing my screen? No. Okay, I will share screen. And 
this. I think I know how to do this. I think you do. I'll make sure I'll get yeah. No, I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> Why isn't it? We can get our help from the library if we need this. That's no, I, th I think it's part being hosted by the library. Wonderful. Uh, okay. Um, it might not be enabled for you. So that's where I'm, I'm just going to ping. Here, let me look, check really quick. The problem is when I hit play. Uh, she, she should be set up to do it. Okay. Uh, okay, just a minute. I got it to work before. Um, there was one question, Ann Magoon, um, yeah. that maybe you know the answer to that someone asked about. Um, they asked, do you know what's in the time capsule that was on Cass Street? I wish I did. Um, I can tell you that the owners of the building wish they did too, uh, but it has not been opened. It is still there. We, we were told when the building was built what was in it, but we haven't seen it, I guess is what I mean. So it's documentation from the first years, who was there at the first meeting and the bylaws, things like that. So it's documents from the, the early years of the women's, um, the, the Ladies Library Association. But exactly what it is, I'm not, not sure. Thank you. Okay. Can you see a slide? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, awesome. We are ready to go. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump in and broaden what um, Anne and Anne put together about the ladies library. And I'm going to place the activities of both the uh, Ladies Library Association, the League of Women Voters, and then some other groups into a wider picture of women's history during those times. I wanna start by describing just what it was really like and by showing in photographs a few more than Anne had, what it was like in Traverse City in 1869 uh, this is probably the very early 1870s. It's one of the first photographs we have uh, in the archives. And this is looking north from about where Union and Grandview Parkway intersect today. You can see Bowers Harbor off in the far background of this picture. And to the left, those little white buildings that you see to the left are the original Hanalei Mercantile buildings. So you can see how raw Traverse City was actually even a couple of years after the founding of the Ladies Library Association. This is the building of the Union Street Dam in the area where they're now going to put in the fish pass. Again, late 1860s, 1868 or 69, one of the first photographs we have. And I put this in here because it's a close-up of the mercantile, but I find it interesting. It's mostly men. I just noticed if you look way over to the left, there's one woman way in the background there um, with her long dress on. And this is, I, maybe Anne or Anne can jump in. I believe either the first building or the second one down in this image is um, the ladies library building on Front Street. I want to read from Richard Fiddler's book, Glimpses of Grand Traverse Past. I'm going to take just a moment here, guys. Steven? I think it's the third one in, the third one down, Peg. Okay, but the, well, it doesn't have a, the third one down doesn't have a balcony on. Well, that's true. I just saw that little side side thing on the second one that used to be on the first one. <laughs> it, it was its second from the corner of chaos. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm thinking that it, anyway, this is the same stretch of street. And what I want you to know is everything is um, panel. What everything is wooden buildings. So from Richard Fittler's book, Glimpses of Grand Traverse Past, I love what he wrote here about Traverse City in 1869, which by the way, had 1,200 citizens. Richard wrote, it was a raw, dirty, hot place in the summer, a precarious settlement of simple frame buildings with nothing more than plain benches to sit on. In establishing a library in that setting, 
this group of women was doing something more than providing books to those who could read them. They were introducing civilization to a place where it was greatly needed. It was a fine vision for an isolated village situated very far from the centers of culture. The role of women settling in an area has been well described by Anne Magoon. I did an article, I don't know if uh, any of you saw it, I did an article last Sunday, I believe, and Anne helped me with that article. And what I was really interested in was her pointing out that in the past, as areas were settled, women arriving in the area indicated that the area was moving from being explored to being settled. So by and large, most explorers were male, not all, but by and large, the most of them were the front line. And then once women started coming in, then homes started being built, churches started being built, and an area became settled. And this was true not only in the United States, but also in other areas of the world. And in a way, I believe it was probably also true among the Native Americans. And I think it's really important that we remember that is, can you see my picture still? No. Yeah. yeah, okay. That we remember that the Native Americans and in our case, the Adawa or the, the ancestors of our current Grand Traverse band were here before we were. So the white people didn't just show up to an empty land, it was already settled. And even, and I'm not an expert in Native American culture, but it's my understanding that even in the Native American culture, uh, usually it was the men that went out hunting, it was the men that went out in the war parties and sort of expanded. And then the women, if, if a tribe moved into an area that women, the women came in and settled, it was settled and became part of that tribe's uh, land where they lived on a regular basis, even if they you know, moved places between summer and winter. So this is a typical Adawa wigwam. And this is actually, again, a very early 1870s picture of the mouth of the Boardman River. And long before the white people came, the uh, tribes would move into this area in the spring for blueberry picking and for fishing. And this is a very early photograph of uh, some of the Native Americans, probably mostly from up in Leelanau County, coming down into this area. And I also find this an extremely interesting picture. This is Slab Town. We're not sure of the date. I'm guessing it's around sometime in the 1890s. Uh, but it's an, obviously a Native American family. I'd be willing to bet that the white man in the picture is not the husband of the Native American woman. So maybe he belonged to the lumber company. Slabs, uh, Slab Town is called Slab Town because the workers at the lumber mills were allowed to bring the pieces of wood that could not be sold back to wherever they lived and build their homes out of it. Uh, so the Native American women, who I'm sure were essential to the life of their villages, continued doing that even as their own culture changed significantly after white settlement. Again, based on something Anne Magoon said, and, and I agree with it, once women arrived in an area, they often shouldered more than half the responsibilities. Still, much of what they did was undervalued. They were seen as simply fulfilling the role of wife. Yet such wives were as important as anyone else in creating and sustaining their communities. Anne pointed out during her talk that a lot of the women that were involved in the LL Ladies Library Association and even in the League of Women Voters tended to be rather privileged. They had had an advanced degree, uh, in the Ladies Library Association, they probably, their husbands made enough money that they had time. They could probably hire people to help them if they had a bigger home. So they didn't have to stay home and do all the cleaning and everything. And uh, we have to remember that not only the women that were able to 
be active in women's organizations, but also the women that were at home having the families and bringing up their children were also creating community. Here we have probably again, 1880s, I'm guessing from the woman's dress, we have a log house, a very nice log house, very well kept up. Um, this is not a daily photo, you can tell because the people are very well dressed, they wouldn't be dressed like this on a daily basis. Notice the windmill. This house does not have electricity and I'll get into that a little bit later. Here's a, another photo that is more every day. They aren't nearly as dressed up. It does show men doing some of their, apparently they're sharpening axes and things. But here are the women churning the butter, washing clothing, very much contributing to the fact that the community could continue to grow and thrive. We don't know who those people were. We do know who this woman is. And I, I love this picture. It's not a quality picture, but we know who she is. And this was taken in 1927. It is Yolanda Campo washing her clothes at her home on North Long Lake Road at Secor Road. So we even know exactly where she lived. She became ill a few days later and died. Her daughter, Margaret, was going to college at the time, which was fairly unusual, even in 1927. But she shopped because um, when her mother died, she had a younger sister. She had to go home from Mount Pleasant and take care of her younger sister. But she received her teaching certificate later. And I show this picture partly just to show that life for your non-privileged housewife was not easy, even today and certainly into the 1930s. And one of the reasons it wasn't easy was because they didn't have electricity. Um, I just saw an article today that is by the mid 1930s, only 3% of Michigan's rural population had access to power. So that the, the spread of electricity into the farmlands happened because of the Rural Electrification Act, uh, the FDR administration during the depression. Until that time, a lot of women simply did not have much time to be involved in the larger community. It took all the time they had if they didn't have enough money to hire someone to come in and help. The work they had to do every day in terms of farming, cleaning, cooking, took, out, took up a vast majority of their time. Another quote from Anne Magoon that I used in my article was, she said, women, even well-behaved ones, really make history and define community. And I love that. And not only the more privileged women of the Ladies Library Association, but also the women that kept the community going. And I had to add this picture because it's just one of my favorite stories. Um, we have this story of uh, Mrs. Campo, who I would say was probably, I'm guessing, one of what we would call the well-behaved women that did the things that were handed to her. We need those women. We also need women like, I don't know if any of you recognize, but this is Brie Larson, no, Brie Newsom, who in 2015 climbed the flagpole in front of the South Carolina State House and took down the stars and bars. And in her case, it wasn't a woman's history action. It was more of a black history action. But regardless of what you think about what she did or why she did it, it certainly, she was not being well behaved at the time that she did it. So I think it takes all those different types of women to make things work. So while women built community as individual wives and mothers, and occasionally as lone settlers or explorers, up until recently, the most common way for women to significantly influence the community was by working through women's organizations. Of course, there were always individual women like suffragists Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton seen on the left. Susan B. Anthony is standing up, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is sitting down 
or pioneering journalist Nellie Bly on the right, who defied such boundaries. But for many decades, most women tended to work behind the scenes and through women's organizations rather than publicly as individuals. This is because becoming civically active also was a break with tradition in a society that saw man's sphere as being the public world and a woman's sphere as being the home. Engaging in civic activities as part of a group and as their husband's wives made the actions of such women more acceptable to the wider society. So a lot of those um, women that we saw pictures of, the Ladies Library Association, it was easier and probably more effective for them to work through the association than going out as individuals on their own. And I love this uh, cartoon which was probably published in the teens, in the 19 teens during the battle for women's suffrage. This is not in the record eagle. I'm not sure where it came from. I got it from the National Archives. Down at the bottom, it says, devotes her time to gossip and clothes because she has nothing else to talk about. Give her broader interests and she will cease to be vain and frivolous. So here she is having kicked fashion and gossip to the side, looking over the fence. We appear looking beyond the woman's sphere to the women's vote. And down below, you see women voting uh, along with their baby and their very nicely done up clothing and their hat. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the other women's organizations in town besides the Ladies Library. This is what it looked like in the 1870s when the Ladies Library Association started going. The next organization I wanted to mention was the uh, Traverse City Women's Club, which operated from 1891 to 2008. Their members studied, socialized, and worked to improve their community. They were talented artists, poets, authors, businesswomen, newspaper editors, and teachers. Many had college degrees. They focused on problems plaguing society, such as garbage collection and clean water. And many of the women that belong to the Women's Club also belong to the Ladies Library Association. And this picture is from probably around 1900, shows how much Traverse City had changed between 1869 and the early 1870s and the time that the Traverse City Women's Club uh, began operating. Uh, during the 1880s, this was a boom time. There was a lot of money coming into Traverse City. And so lots of brick buildings were built, many of which, which still stand. This is the same picture you saw, the Ladies Library Association. I added a couple of more because I think we tend to think of our grandmothers and great grandmothers and great great grandmothers, the ones that we know about, as being rather serious and aimed towards civic improvement. But you know what? They also knew how to have fun. This is also the Ladies Library Association. And here they have some men and some children around. And I believe those are marshmallows. And this is another photograph of the Ladies Library Association, probably the mid 1890s. And they apparently have dates or husbands there with them. Another group, uh, and the thing about, I wanted to point about the lady, both of these organizations and a couple of more I will briefly talk about is at least some of their records are all in the local history collection at the Traverse City Library. It is an incredibly wonderful treasure trove of records that document one of the ways that women um, influence this area. Uh, another organization, whose records are there is the Friendly Garden Club that started in 1923. So this is what Traverse City looked like when the Friendly Garden Club, which still operates, got started. This is looking west. You can see the um, Old Kent Bank or what is now Fifth Third Bank building here. Friendly Garden Club operated all the way through the 1900s up till today. They're responsible for many things, including the Logo Garden and the Children's Garden at Tattle. And two other groups, or three other groups that have a lot of their records at the Traverse City Local History Collection are the League of Women Voters, which Anne has already discussed, the American Association of University Women, 
uh, both of whom started uh, the AAUW local chapter began in 1954 and the league local chapel chapter started in 1960. So here's what it looked like about that time in Traverse City. This is a larger view. And um, again, I can't remember if I, how well I pointed this out, but a lot of women being able to become involved in things like the League of Women Voters was uh, technology. I mean, imagine if all the cooking you had to do was done by having to chop wood and stick the wood in the wood stove and go haul the water from the creek, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the last group I wanted to talk about that is represented in the archives at the Tattle is the Women's History Project of Northwestern Michigan, which operated from 2000 to 2020. And both Anne and Anne and I all were founding members of that group. And it did a lot of things, held a lot of programs, honored Women's History Day, Women's History Month. But the thing I think that it did, which may have the longest term value, is it organized over 125 oral histories of women from the surrounding area, all of which are also at Tattle and will be available um, in the archives. This is a picture of the archives. It just so happens I'm in the picture, but it shows Michelle who is now um, the head of the library and therefore responsible for making sure all of these records are kept. And the two younger women are Victoria Coro and Megan Owens, who were the 2019 Peter Till interns, uh, college age, usually students that receive a stipend during the summer to come in and learn about archives and work on uh, making the collection even better organized than it already is. And I don't want, to, I want us to have time to talk, so I'm rushing a little bit, but I want to end with this slide, which is from the 1960s. So it goes back to about the time the League of Women Voters local organization was founded. And the reason I'm showing it is it's the Traverse City Chamber of Commerce building that sat where the one stand, sits now. And frankly, I always disliked the architecture of this building. It's not my type of architecture, but I've run into people that really like it. And the reason I'm including it is one, it shows the time period that these local organizations from the mid 1900s began operating in the area. It also looks to me like it's upside down. And <laughs> the reason I'm ending with this is I think when great societal change comes, women getting the vote, moving out of the sphere of the home into the sphere of the community, perhaps other minority groups, women aren't really a minority group, but groups that have operated more behind the scene, when they start to move, it may feel like society is turning upside down. And that may be uncomfortable for some people, but in the long run, I truly believe it's better for everybody. So that's my quick talk of uh, various women's groups that are represented in the Traverse City Archives. And if, I don't know if we have time for chat, but I will stop sharing and let Jen or Betsy take over. Yeah, we certainly have time and I'd love to have questions. So I can scroll through if anyone wants to feel like they're raising their hand, Betsy will look too. We don't have any questions in the chat right now. Okay. Um, so I don't know if, yeah, I mean, if there's anything else you wanna add or Ann or Ann as, as you were putting all of this together, if you feel like there's anything that you wanted to touch on that you did not, you are welcome to. Well, I, um, I I will just ask Ann Sweeney to clarify the relationships, because I think I might have bobbled it, uh, the relationships between Estella Neeland, who was the Ladies Library Association uh, leader for so long, and all the way down to this day to Julie Maxson. I want to clarify that. Okay, I can do that. Thank you. Um, Yes, uh, it was actually four generations and one was not in the library business. So it started with Estella and then went to um, 
Mary Jane Neeland Hunter. And the interesting thing is she was the head of the Oak Park branch and she lived right down the, the street from it. And so she would, you know, trudge on down there and, and, and work every day. And it was, it was a happening place. It was very, very busy because that was the east side branch for the Carnegie Library. Um, then her daughter, Lucy, was not, um, she was not a librarian, but she was still into books. And evidently she trained her daughter, Julie, right? Because then Julie Maxson was head of the Peninsula Library for many, many years. Um, and I can still see Julie's face in Estelle's when I look at it and it, it makes me smile. <laughs> and I see that Julie is actually here today listening to the history of this. So that's nice. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Well, I, I'll just make a quick comment because I, I felt it was sort of karma or serendipity, I guess. One could, could say that the Ladies Library Association, its first building is sort of the great, great, great grandmother of the building sitting on Woodmere. And I think it's rather um, happy circumstance that the records of the Ladies Library Association are in a building that has that kind of connection to the very first building um, that they put together and offered to the community for its use. Yeah, I, I don't know whether I don't know whether Ann Swaney can pull up the uh, photo that we had of the Ladies Library Association, I sort of skipped over that a little bit to point out which one is the building that that was theirs back on Front Street. Um, and I, I also want to say, agreeing with Peg, that the book that we are writing, and when I say we are writing, Anne and I and a few others are doing the research for the author, um, started out with this League of Women Voters effort it was a really a community effort to get the, the new library built and, and to help with the other relations with libraries. And um, as we got into it, the, we went back and back and back in history and the ladies library just became such a fascinating part of, of the story. We couldn't leave it out. So, okay, now on, on the picture that Anne is going to put up, I think she's gonna get a full screen there. Um, it's, it's the first building with the gable is the Ladies Library Association um, building. I'm not sure that it looked like that its entire life, but that, that is the corner of front, the, the street that you see going uh, kind of left to right, and Cass is right where we are. So yeah. Anne's cursor, it's the one, it has the... Um, the lightning rod right on top. Right, and and if you wouldn't mind leaving that up for just a second, I'm pulling up my picture. You guys can all keep talking and if you have questions <laughs> from the audience, I'm just gonna try to compare the two and see. Yeah. So it's been fascinating to, and and if you get a chance to read this, this book, I think you'll enjoy some of the uh, things that we've talked about today, but many, many other anecdotes um, little stories uh, about about the uh, history of Traverse City um, and civic involvement with with a number of women over the years. Well, and if I could um, interject just for a moment, uh, Heather interviewed over um, twenty live people <laughs> for for this book, and so there's information that we didn't know until we heard their stories. These were librarians that were involved. With, with Tattle and people in the Citizens for Library Committee and um, you know former Mayor Carroll, they all just people that were involved um, in, in the more recent part of our history. And, and that I, I just want to say for anyone that puts effort into oral history or any kind of research, I mean, Carol Hale has now recently passed away. And if she was actually able to be interviewed for this, what a valuable thing that's going yeah. to be. Um, in the future. And, and, and we are going to get them all transcribed, all the or oral histories also. Hey, Anne, this is a good time to mention about the um, your, your plan for the reading. 
maybe people will want to volunteer. <laughs> I, I think it must have been late at night and I was already dreaming when I came up with the idea that because we can't afford to do an audio book of the, the story that, that we're telling, that it would be fun and appropriate perhaps to do a uh, crowdsourced reading of the book. It, it breaks into small sections very easily. And it seems to me that it would be great to have people from all over this, the area take a piece of the book and read it for and have it recorded. And that way we would have a story for the Talking Books Library, which is part of the um, Traverse Area District Library. So if people are interested in that, we might have to um, audition people for reading. Uh, we might not have any interest, I don't know, but um, anyway, that's something that just seemed to me uh, in line with the kind of thing that we do when, when we can't do what we might choose to do, we find something even better. There was a question where uh, Susan Odgers asked, what are a few lessons that we can learn from our sisters that would help us today with regard to libraries and activism? And that's open to anyone. I'm going to throw out the word perseverance. I was going to say never give up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think the idea of teamwork is so important that sometimes uh, people have a passion, but they want it done their way, exactly their way, and uh, aren't able to come together working with a team often teamwork makes things much better than they would have been done if just one person is doing it. But it's, it is necessary to build a coalition or build a, uh, a group of uh, who are supporting you rather than to try to do things on your own. So that's certainly one thing that the women's groups, uh, whether it's a church group or a PTA or the AAUW or the league or whatever, I, I think uh, women working together has been very powerful over the years. So that doesn't apply just to libraries, certainly. Um, and I, I would also, did I interrupt you, Anne? No. no. Okay, I, I guess I'll just jump in and say also, as I was working on the article and working on this, I, I know there was some, um, I, I, I was not active in the uh, Women's History Project for the last couple of decades. And I know that having to uh, let it go because in terms of not enough people acting was a hard thing. But I think we all have to remember that just because a group no longer exists doesn't mean that what it did wasn't extremely valuable, not only for the people who were directly involved, but for the legacy it leaves. And I, we can see that in the Ladies Library Association and the Traverse City Women's Club, which actually was, I don't know how much it met, but it officially existed until 2008. So, I mean, it lasted well over a hundred years. Uh, the Women's History Project, maybe only 20 years, but it did a lot during those 20 years. So I think another lesson we can learn is it's not so much necessarily longevity or lasting forever. It's what you do while you're doing it. And, and uh, one of the reasons that the name was chosen, the Women's History Project, I think of a project as having a beginning and an end. And, and so it, it was kind of in my mind anyway, that we'll just see how this goes. We'll see when, how long we need it. And if there's interest in all, we will continue it. And I agree with Peg that the oral histories are a treasure. Um, we were committed to having them recorded. Uh, certainly that was part of it, but having them transcribed immediately. Uh, many organizations have the funding and interest in getting recordings and they say, oh, sometime down the road, we'll transcribe these. And then it never happens. And then the tapes or, or whatever the recordings are, are damaged or lost and, and they don't have um, the transcriptions, which is really too bad. It takes a long time to listen to a two hour uh, recording, like 
two hours and you can read a transcript much faster. So if you're doing research, it's great to start with the transcription, go through it quickly. And then if you wanna go back and hear the voice or hear the intonations or hear if there was anything done incorrectly, you can go back to the recording, but uh, those transcriptions are, are very valuable. We're grateful to have those. That's fantastic. Thank you everyone so much for doing this and um, for pulling it together so quickly. Um, I the library absolutely appreciates it. Um, so thank you to the Traverse Area Historical Society and Magoon and Ann Sweeney and of course Peg and Jen for coming and hosting too, yeah. <laughs> introducing. Um, it, as Jen said earlier, this will be recorded and it'll be on our um, uh, Tattle Not Just Books uh, YouTube channel, which you can get directly at tattle.org and just click on the icon. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you. Anything from you, Jen? Um, I was going to say thank you to the library. Also mention if people are not already members of the Traverse Area Historical Society, we would love to have you. Um, you can find us at traversehistory.org. Um, and then another Zoom event happening in two weeks, I mentioned in the chat. Um, but pertinent to what we were talking about today, uh, Traverse City Human Rights Commission is hosting a panel with four indigenous women. Um, they're talking about their backgrounds and then a kind of a movement to include indigenous women in the news. The Record Eagle is involved in this. Um, and so speaking of voices and that kind of thing, the link's not up yet, but that will be on the Traverse City City page. So wanted to say something about that and thanks. Yeah, that was a great, I love the discussion and talk about teamwork, people coming together for a great presentation. So thanks And thank again. you to the Historical Society for inviting us. Um, also, we still haven't come up with a name for a book and we have to do it pretty soon because it's almost ready to go to the designer. So if you can think of something that would cover, you know, 150 years of libraries, send us, send us a note. <laughs> Pages of history is the best we have so far, plus what's your latest one? Timeless, timeless something other is, is another one, but we're, we're open to suggestions. Send them to any of us. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to.